Um, I shortened the title to uh, <laughs> Uh, it's down to mobile-based livelihood services in Africa. Um, and basically what I'm trying to do is uh, have a look at what else is going on in services for the various types of small enterprises um, that you, you'll find all across Africa. So I've actually combined on purpose. How's it going? Okay. I have combined on purpose farms, small agricultural producers, uh, microenterprises and the self-employed. Um, I think that you can learn some things by putting them in, in, in a similar analytical category uh, for this purpose, and then later on we would uh, we'd disaggregate them again. Um, so the reason I think you can, you can combine and talk about what are mobile services uh, possibly offering to these various types of enterprises is the fact that in, you know, in, in some ways they're incredibly different from each other. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're raising chickens or you're growing you know, cassava or something like that, that's not the same as fixing cell phones. But if you are a tiny enterprise that traditionally hasn't had an opportunity to use computers, uh, maybe hasn't even had a landline phone, um, you kind of occupy some similar structural positions in the, in the economy. You, you may be more informal than formal. Um, and chances are you're struggling to survive. Um, most of the small businesses uh, aren't growth-oriented enterprises. They're just you know, getting up and, and trying to earn enough to, to feed the kids and send them to school. Um, what's happening is, is there are a bunch of interesting um, mobile phone applications that are coming down the pipe, uh, which are designed to address uh, the, the needs of these various small enterprises. But before I get to them, let me uh, kind of put a couple stakes in the ground of what we know and what I'm actually not going to discuss for the rest of the, the talk. Um, what we know is that you know, what the evidence is starting to come, despite the comments earlier about you know, we're not there yet, is actually the evidence is starting to, 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 to accumulate that like landline phones, um, mobile phones can be used to deepen interactions with customers, they can replace travel, um, and they can, can allow small producers and, and small firms to uh, participate in broader and more efficient markets. And there's you know, great studies from around the world coming on this. What's different between landlines, um, and actually there's a literature going back 30 or 40 years on landlines, um, but what's different is mobiles are affordable. They're suddenly in the hands of small producers, small enterprises, where they were never possible, it was never possible to have a landline before. So we're seeing this kind of explosion of, of research on mobiles, but a lot of that doesn't actually have to do much with mobile mobility per se, as much as it has to do with what connectivity brings. And so if I wanted to kind of encapsulate the, the, the single best piece of evidence we have for the impact of mobile telephony or connectivity, it would be this Jensen paper um, from a couple years ago now. And this is actually from, from, uh, from South India. But uh, this is, you know, Jensen um, managed to track the price of fish in, in three market areas off the coast of Kerala uh, over a five-year period. And this is just a beautiful graph, because that bar there is uh, when the towers arrived, when the cell phone signal arrived in these various communities, and that's the price of fish. I mean, it's just a profound, easy-to-view sense of, of, of impact, right? What, what Jensen, as an economist, was talking about, the convergence towards the law of one price, the role of information in the system, and there it is, right? And this is actually a welfare benefit, both for producers and consumers. I guess there's less waste. It's great. Um, I'm actually not going to talk more about this type of impact because what this has, what, what there's not here is a service, right, other than the cell phone service itself. This is peer-to-peer -peer organization, just people making phone calls to other people um, and spreading information that way. And so that's where our evidence is right now. What we don't have much on yet in terms of evidence is what else can you do with a mobile phone beyond making person-to-person -person voice calls or sending person-to-person -person mess SMSs. And here's this case where I think the innovations are um, quite naturally racing ahead of the research right now. There's a bunch of pilots and early deployments which are using mobiles as a platform for some sort of service to support information sharing or coordination, the financial services that Francois mentioned earlier, um, and PACE I would put in, in this category. Um, most, uh, most are pilot programs or, or just niche services. Um, 
but we need to know a little bit more. So what I'm doing with the rest of this talk is, all I've done is a second-hand literature search. It's not a, a major study here. Um, but I've done a scan of and trying to find as many of these active on the continent as I could find and you know, put them in categories and make some assertions about them. So uh, let me actually tell you one more thing about methods and I'll, then I'll tell you what I've found. Um, when I say there's not much evidence, it doesn't mean there's no evidence, right? And so there are some places we can go to find uh, information on these various services. Some of it comes from new media. There's sources like Kiwanja, which is Ken Banks, and Mobile Active, where you can see kind of pointers to some of these programs. Uh, there's a weblog, MMD4D, which has a whole page on this. There's a Wikipedia page on it. Um, there are reviews coming out of the kind of the development literature, where they're looking at uh, single, uh, single deployments and talking about them. Um, there are a couple kind of more methodical evaluations of two of the larger players, which I'll talk about later on. Um, and I basically found as many of those as I could using the secondary sources and then uh, augmented that with you know, primary sources and, and my own knowledge of the space to try and gather together a list. Um, in terms of a focus for the review then, like I said, I'm doing services beyond voice calls and peer-to-peer -peer SMS. I'm not talking about the basic impact of having a telephone having a mobile phone. I'm talking about what services are being run on top of the mobile platform. I'm only focusing on mobile handsets. I'm not doing laptops or RFID or GPRS or anything like that. Um, and uh, GPS, I am doing GPRS. Um, and I'm trying to capture just general trends. I don't have enough data to do like a full evaluation of which ones work and which don't. So I'm gonna show you five or six different categories which I found, then I'll put them in a table or two, surprise, surprise. I'll make a couple assertions at the end, and then, and then we'll have some questions. So the first one, I think, um, is agricultural extension, you know, which is the old tradition of you know, sending somebody out to talk to the farmers about the stuff that the farmers already know, right? You know, but this notion of trying to help, you know, trying to kind of exchange information to help farmers be more productive. Um, you know, this went through face-to-face -face iterations. There's TV. You can use radio. You, know, you can do all these sorts of things. It's not surprising to see that some groups are trying to do this using a mobile channel. Um, so there are push modes where you're just getting a bunch of um, farmer telephone numbers and sending out SMSs every couple weeks with tips. You know, I, don't know, I actually don't know how helpful you can be in 160 characters, but they're trying. Um, there are pull mechanisms where it's a little bit more um, customized, where people can query a database of common questions. Um, the India examples are actually more advanced on this. Here there are people doing it on a voice channel um, where you know, there's a sort of a, um, there, there's a, there's a way you can kind of peer, you can pull in and, and um, ask for uh, information which will then route you to a recorded answer which will, which will bring, the, uh, bring the tip back to you. And then there's a, you know, Google in, um, in Uganda in collaboration with the Grameen uh, Technology Group. Uh, is looking at Farmer's Friend, which again is like an SMS-based pull mechanism where you send a question in, it does its magic and sends back a question to you, or sends back a response. Um, I haven't found anything from, agricult uh, from non-agriculture yet. Nobody's doing this as far as I can tell for what's called business development services uh, for small firms. Uh, second one, virtual, is it in this one? Yeah, I did, market information. Um, this is, basically prices, right? Um, and look, there's a huge list of ones coming down uh, in, all across the continent. And I think it's because it's actually not that difficult uh, technically to do, and it's a natural fit for price information. Nice, tight, small piece of data on a small number of things, like what's the price of wheat, what's the price of cassava, you know, uh, how far is it to the market. That can be done over SMS, and we see a lot of them happening, sponsored by governments sometimes, by NGOs, by the agricultural extension institutions, um, and some private sector companies actually trying to make a, make a go of it uh, as well, just you know, delivering that market information. My question on this one is whether the systems are actually that much of an improvement over uh, farmers calling their own friends or calling their own suppliers. Right? Like, you know, I know that there's a benefit to knowing what that price is. I don't know what the incremental benefit is about you know, whether it's coming less expensively, whether it's more reliable, all these sorts of things by having a centralized actor do it. That would be a great further research question. Um, virtual marketplaces. We're, notice we're getting a little bit more 
uh, tricky here. Um, this is where you're actually not just trying to pump out prices or farmer tips, but you're actually trying to match buyers and sellers. Um, there are fewer of these things live that I could find um, in, in Africa right now, but they're coming, right? Um, Mobile for Good is, is uh, uh, their Kazi thing in, in, um, in Kenya is actually a job thing where it, it's a match where you can search for jobs, you can post jobs, and, and, and that's what it's doing. So it's not just agricultural. Uh, the Zambia um, National Farmers Union is trying a system that will give you your price information and will also tell you two or three buyers, which are potential buyers, which are interested in, in, in getting a match. They're actually trying to make steps towards creating a virtual marketplace. Um, and Google Trader, again, in Uganda is trying this as well. Um, th these, I think, are begging for, a, again, like a major evaluation. Um, because there's a whole kind of uh, chicken and egg thing about what, when do you go to these marketplaces if there aren't buyers there yet and you need, a, you need kind of a critical mass to get them going. It's a, it's a harder sell than just, than just pushing out price information. Um, if you can get it to work, fantastic, but there's all sorts of questions of context and everything which I'll come back to in a little while. Um, we're almost through with these, uh, with these sets of, of, uh, of types, um, three left. Financial services, and this is what Francois mentioned earlier with, with M-Pesa, uh, or actually Wizit was your example in South Africa. Um, these mobile money systems are a big deal um, in, in Africa. There's a lot of hype and a lot of hope around them. They are potentially transformational in the sense that they can extend financial services to traditionally unbanked populations. Um, they haven't necessarily been targeted at, at enterprises yet. They've been targeted at individuals. But you can see where the, the mapping between an individual and a tiny enterprise is pretty, you know, they're, they're, they're often like that anyway. So the, the, the opportunities for the smallest producers, smallest firms to, to use these sorts of systems are definitely there. Um, this group called Credit SMS has compiled a list of at least 23 distinct systems in South Africa that are, sorry, in Africa that are either already active or, or, or pending now. So this is the real thing that's happening. Um, and Pace is, frankly, the only one that's, that's gotten to scale. You know, they've got six million users in a country of 45 million people or something um, in two years, which is just remarkable. That's in Kenya. Everybody else is kind of nibbling around, um, you know, that hasn't seen the same success as m -Pesa yet. Um, but I think what's most interesting is that last point, which is that, you know, that Kenya's far enough along that what you're seeing is a little bit of the appropriation and, uh, you know, kind of process happening where, you know, firms are starting to accept um, M-Pesa as a form of transaction. Um, people are doing it to pay for drinks at nightclubs. They're doing it to uh, send money in different directions than the system was originally designed. They're starting to save money on the system, use it as a stored value as opposed to just transferring in and out. So it shows you that when you get that critical mass, you, know, you get this sort of invention processes happening, which I think bodes well for the transformational potential, the, the impact potential of this particular type of mobile livelihood service uh, for you know, small firms and, and small farms. Um, and I think the most kind of uh, out there example, this is weird, this is, this is my first of two strange slides. This slide is strange because my first example is quite traditional in this, in this space, which is who's using a mobile phone to deliver a direct means of livelihood too small to, 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 to individuals, as opposed to helping them do whatever livelihood it is they're doing. So instead of helping somebody be a better farmer, you're giving somebody an income using the phone. Um, and so you know, the Grameen Village Phone Program is the best example of this. Um, you know, this is where you, 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 know, loan a, you loan enough money for generally a woman entrepreneur to purchase a phone, pay it back over time, buy some airtime, and become a provider for their village. Um, and you know, this has various degrees of formality or informality depending on where you are. Arab Assay's work from Ghana had those pictures which you showed of, of this very, very, just a, you know, a guy on a bike kind of thing. There's no great international NGO brand behind that, but he's doing the same service essentially. Um, and what I think what's nice is that some firms actually have built uh, hardware and software that are specific to shared phone scenarios like SciTech in, in, uh, in South Africa. And this is actually a SciTech phone, this looks like it's a, a landline phone. It's informal on a street just in a, in a neighborhood in Cape Town, but it's actually connected in the back end to a, a GSM signal. So it's a, it's a mobile phone, essentially. It's a shared mobile phone. Um, quite by contrast, um, you've got 
just very interesting idea from Nathan Eagle, uh, who's with MIT and he's working in Kenya, on crowdsourcing by the phone. Right? And this is something called Text Eagle, where you take a big task, like a translation task or an error checking task or something like that, cut it into using fancy servers and computers and all that, cut it into lots of small bits and send it out 160 characters at a time to individuals who then can, you know, if in their spare time or their time, if they don't have other jobs, essentially do these trans translation tasks and send them back. And then you re-aggregate it. You do something called crowdsourcing and you've got something that you've you know, uh, of considerable complexity that you've managed to uh, do it at fairly low cost. And, you know, Nathan suggests this is a win-win and people are making money, they're getting livelihoods from this. And again, they're using M-Pesa to pay for these services, which is, again, I think um, kind of interesting. So this is a, a, a different category, kind of direct livelihood support, but it's worth bringing up. I have one last category, uh, and this is, again, a bit of a tension slide, and then I'll, then I'll do the review. Um, and this is these comprehensive platforms, um, which take elements of all of those things I was describing before and roll them up into larger interventions. Um, that quote up top, I think, is, uh, this is from Mark Davis, who runs Asoco, which is one of the two biggest players in the space. He says, while running TradeNet, which was the first iteration of Asoco, we realized that there was a need for a platform to integrate the whole supply chain, not just to provide prices. We're missing the point if we don't integrate the whole industry. And so what you have here is TradeNet um, slash Asoco, which started in Ghana, um, and Manobi, which is a French firm with, with also roots in Senegal, ha have you know, multiple countries with big, big projects taking on an entire vertical at a time. Like they'll do the whole mango industry for Mali or something like that. I don't know which one. Sorry, the, the examples are in the paper. Um, but they'll do an industry at a time and basically try to roll the whole thing up into becoming a mediated platform. These are, these are you know, million dollar projects. You've got people on the ground. You've got extensive websites. And, and that mobile phone you see shooting out prices or gathering quality information, for example, is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and what's also interesting about this, as we start to get a little bit more critical about it, is it, they often have one eye specifically on export markets. So they're using these systems to gather the data you would need to satisfy, for example, European Union organic regulations, which you just, you got to get more data into the system to do it. And these guys like TradeNet and Asoco can support that. But these are big centralized, you know, um, development initiatives, right? They're not little um, kind of... Uh, user-led innovations. Um, but by contrast, you've got something like Frontline SMS, which is Ken Banks' work, which is incredibly lean and incredibly flexible, right? Um, it's just a little bit of code that any NGO can use to run any kind of SMS two-way communication system it wants. And what we see is there's a lot of people who have taken the SMS code to do things of all those sorts I was just talking about, farm price information, uh, agricultural extension, and all that. So. Uh, Two thoughts in conclusion, actually three. The first is SMS right now rules a roost. Of the two dozen I saw, almost all, more than 20, are SMS-based systems. And if I were to start a system today anywhere in Africa, I'd probably use SMS too. But it's not a no-brainer anymore. The, and the question needs to become discussable is when is the transition going to happen to uh, GPRS, to internet, to mobile internet? You can do so much more at so much lower cost if you can get people over the hurdle of purchasing the more expensive phone. Um, you can do a better interface that's better for low literacy populations. You can move data at much lower cost per bit. You can coordinate much more effectively if you can get beyond SMS. And what I think we'll see in five years is, is, a, is a whole mix of some people are going to use you know, GPRS for some systems. Some people are going to still be on SMS. And it really depends on you know, segment by segment by segment. Who's your end user? How much money do they have in their pocket? When are you gonna, wh what's going to work? Uh, it used to be you could, we could really only talk about SMS. And you know, we see in uh, Bangladesh, Cell Bazaar, which is a virtual marketplace, is already got a, a, a GPRS data channel. Frog Tech, which is launching in Colombia, uh, is going to support retail enterprises using a smartphone. They've chosen different paths than, than SMS. Um, so if I were to put this all together, I would say, you know, this is adapted from an earlier paper I wrote with Marcella Escobari about what, you know, kind of how transformational was the mobile phone just in, you know, using it as a mobile phone. Here we say how, trans how intended, 
how, what's the degree of intended transformation associated with these different services? So I kind of array them. There's different things you can do if you're targeting an enterprise. You can help them you know, uh, improve their internal activities, just be more productive. You can add more market information. You can add buyers and sellers. Uh, you, can, you can help them start a new business. We can bypass middlemen, which is really rewriting the whole value chain, right? And these are, I think, the, the further you go this way, the more you're kind of trying to rewrite people's structural position. And what's actually interesting about a lot of these systems is how, how really not transformational they are as opposed to productivity enhancing. This is fine, and it's really, really helpful, but it's a little, let's dial back on the rhetoric of these things being completely you know, revolutionary. You know? And the ones that are revolutionary to some extent are things like TradeNet Trade and Asoco, which in their own way are just you know, kind of you know, deepening existing trade relationships and all that. So I mean, I think there's more, I just kind of nibble at this question in the paper given the, the space constraints, but I think it's an interesting way to kind of think about what's the degree of intended structural transformation. The, the stuff on the left is easy. The stuff on the right is hard. Uh, so my last slide. Um, these mobile livelihood services, from what I can see based on this little review, um, are often the reflection of, of deeper organizational ecosystems and technologies behind the scenes. The, the mobile's just that, the, the one visible bit. Um, they're deployed by large institutions often. They're certainly contributing to productivity, um, but, and they're bringing these big institutions in line with, uh, in contact with small firms. But we, we need more evaluations to see really how cost effective they are as development interventions and what the impact may be. Um, there are very, very few detailed evaluations of these things. Um, whether they're going to fundamentally transform market structures is, is largely been unexamined um, when it's been discussed. Um, and I think last bit would be further research we can test. My hunch is that not all segments are equally amenable to these sorts of things. Like, for example, the, some that have, you know, if you're dealing with perishable crops, the, the Jensen example is the best one, information matters a lot. If you can sit on your, you know, on your bag of wheat for eight months until somebody comes by, information may not matter quite as much. And there's all sorts of ways which we could take the next step and you know, get into the questions of which markets, which segments are more likely to be kind of using these technologies in, in the most productive ways possible. So thanks a lot.